Hi guys and welcome to another video on data mining the social media uh, with Python and today we are going to talk about analyzing tweets and text analysis. So in the previous video we analyzed the entity field of a tweet. This provides useful knowledge on the tweet because these entities are explicitly curated by the author of the tweet. And in this video we will focus on unstructured data instead, that is the raw text of the tweet. We'll discuss aspects of text analysis such as text pre-processing and normalization. And we'll perform some statistical analysis on the tweets. Before digging the details, we'll introduce some terminology. The first terminology is tokenization. And tokenization is one of the uh, important steps in the pre-processing phase. Given a stream of text, such as tweets, tweet status, tokenization is the process of breaking this text down into individual units called tokens. In the simplest form, these units are words, but we could also work on more complex tokenization that deals with phrases, symbols, and so on. Tokenization sounds like a trivial task, and it's been widely stu studied by the natural language processing community. And one of the first uh, videos in the section called Social Media, Social Data, and Python it's a whole series of videos on that, so you can check that out. There we provided a brief introduction of this field and mentioned how Twitter changes the rules of tokenization because the content of a tweet includes uh, emoticons, emoji, emo, emoticons, and I'm not sure how to spell it, hashtags, user mentions, URLs, and is quite different from standard English. For this reason, when using the Natural Language Toolkit, Toolkit, also shortened NLTK library, we showcase the Tweet Tokenizer class as a tool to tokenize Twitter content. And we'll make use of this tool again in this video. Another pre-processing step that is worth considering is stop word removal. Stop words are words that when taken in isolation are not content bearing. This category of words include articles, proportions, adverbs, and so on. Frequency analysis will show that these words are typically the most common in any data set. While a list of stop words can be compiled automatically by analyzing the data, for example, by including words that are present in more than an arbitrary percentage of the documents, such as 95%. In general, it pays off to be more conservative and use only common English stop words. NLTK library provides a list of common English stop words via the nltk.corpus.stopwords module. Stop word removal can be ex extended to include symbols as well, such as punctuation or domain-specific words. In our Twitter context, common stop words are the terms RT, short for retweet, and via, often used to mention the author of the content being shared. Finally, another important pre-processing step is normalization. This is an umbrella term that can consist of several types of pre-processing. In general, normalization is used when we need to aggregate different terms in the same unit. The special case of normalization considered here is case normalization, where every term in lower case, uh, where every term is in is a lower case, so that strings with 
originally different casing will match. For example, python equal equal to python.lower. The advantage of performing case normalization is that the frequency of a given term will be automatically aggregated rather than being dispersed into the different variations of the same term. So we will um, we produce our first ter uh, term frequency analysis with this string. So pause the video if you want to follow along and copy this code. I'll make it a little bit bigger so it's easy to read. So a little bit about the code. The core of pre-processing logic is implemented by the process function. The function takes a string as input and returns a list of strings as output. All the pre-processing steps mentioned earlier, case normalization, tokenization, and stop words removal are implemented here in a few lines of code. The function also takes two more optional arguments, a tokenizer, that is an object that implements a tokenize method, and a list of stop words. So the stop word removal process can be customized. So when applying stop word removal, the function also removes numerical tokens, for example, 5 or 42 using the is digit function over a string and also the script takes a command line argument from for the dot json l file to analyze it initializes tweet tokenizer used for tokenization and then defines a list of stop words such list is made up of common English stop words coming from the NLTK library as well as punctuation symbols defined in string dot punctuation punctuation to complete the stop word list we also include the RT via and the three dots tokens a single character Unicode symbol for a horizontal ellipsis So, if you run the script, and we use it on the packed JSON file, and it produces the term frequency. He's here. You see here, it's a. Uh, Produce uh, it takes this words included. It should be a stop word. So as we can see, the output contains a mix of words, hashtags, user mentions. Sometimes uh, this also includes URLs and Unicode symbols not captured by the string dot punctuation. Regarding the extra symbols, we could simply extend this the list of stop words to capture this type of punctuation. Regarding hashtags and user mentions, this is exactly what we expect from Tweet Tokenizer. Uh, as all these tokens are valid, maybe something that we didn't expect is the presence of tokens such as its, as we see here, because these are contracted forms of two separate tokens rather than individual tokens on their own if the contracted form is is expanded in both cases for example it is or if we're or will uh, it, it's uh, that is for we are and we will 
all we have is a sequence of stop words because these contracted forms are usually pronou pronouns and common verbs. A full list of English contractions is given uh, on uh, Wikipedia, for example. Here are all the contractions, most of them. So one way to deal with the with this aspect of the English language is to normalize the, these contractions into their extended form. For example, the following function takes a list of tokens and returns normalized list of tokens. To be more precise, a generator as we're using the yield keyword. So if you write this uh, function and you use it down here you see it's it's making it two words here this expands the contraction the main problem with this approach is the need to manually specify all the contractions we're dealing with. While the number of such contractions is limited, it would be a tedious job to translate everything into a dictionary. Moreover, there are some ambiguities that cannot be easily dealt with. For example, the case of its with an, with an apostrophe that we previously encountered. This contraction can be mapped into it is and the list is of course longer. A different approach consists of considering these tokens as stop words because after normalization all their components seem to be seem to be stop words. The best course of action is probably dependent on your application. So the key question is what is going on after the pre-processing step formalized in the process function. Talking about here. For the time being, we can also keep the pre-processing as it is without explicitly dealing with contractions. And one word on yield and generators. The normalize contractions function that we just used here uses the yield keyword instead of return. The, this keyword is used to produce a generator, which is an iterator that you can only iterator, iterate over once as it doesn't store its items in the memory, but generates them on the fly. One of the advantages is to reduce memory consumption, so it's recommendable for iterations over big objects. The keyword also allows to generate multiple items within the same function call. While return would close the computation as soon as it's called. For example, the for loop in normalized contractions function would run only over the first token. And to conclude this uh, tutorial, we'll look into the analysis of term and entity frequencies from a different per perspective. So given the source code that we have for T, term frequency we can extend these scripts by implementing a simple rather than uh, we can extend these scripts by implementing a simple plot rather than printing out the frequency of the most frequencies of the most common term so if you extend the code with this code save the file 
and it should pr uh, produce a term underscore distribution dot png file in the folder that you're working. It doesn't have a png file here right now. But if we run the file, run the script once more, and we should see a png file. So the preceding snippet shows how to plot the term frequencies from Twitter term frequency. It's also easy to apply it for hashtag frequency from an earlier example. After run this script over the tweets on the packet pub JSONL file, we'll create the term distribution.png file. That should look something like this. And this figure doesn't report the terms per se, as the focus of this last analysis is frequency distribution. As we can see from the figure, there are a few terms on the left with very high frequency, for example. The most frequent term is twice more frequent than the ones after position 10 or so. As we move towards the right-hand side of the figure, the curve becomes less steep, meaning that the terms on the right share similar frequencies. And with little modification, we can run the same code using most common up to 1000. So if we take this to up to 1000, let's try this once again. So I just ran the code, I had a little hiccup, and now you see we have more like URLs and emojicons. And let's see at our figure now how it looks. I have a very f slow computer these days, I'm not sure why. So finally, my computer is back and working. So this is the thousand most frequent terms. We can observe this phenomenon even clearer as shown in this figure. The curve that we can observe in this figure represents an op approximation of a power law. In uh, statistics, a power law is a, uh, is a functional relationship between two, uh, two quantities. In this case, the frequency of a term and its position within within the ranking of terms by frequency. This type of distribution always shows a long tail, meaning that a small portion of frequent items dominate the distribution. While there is a large number of items with smaller frequencies, another name for this phenomenon is the 80-20 rule or Pareto principle which states that roughly 80% of the effect comes from 20% of the cause. In our context, 20% of the unique terms account for 80% of all term occurrences. A few decades ago, the American linguistic a linguist uh, called George Zipf Popular, popularized what is nowadays known as Zipf's law. This empirical law states that given a collection of documents, the frequency of any word is inversely proportional to its rank. 
in the frequency table. In other words, the most frequent word will be seen twice as often as the second most frequent one three times as often as the third most frequent one, and so on. In practice, this law describes a trend rather than the precise frequencies. Inter inter interestingly enough, Zipf's law can be generalized for many different natural languages, as well as many language unrelated rankings, ranking studies in social sciences. So that was analyzing tweets in another way so hope you enjoyed the video if you like the video if you can please give me the thumbs up or and subscribe to the channel to support me i would appreciate that so i hope to see you in the next video we are also going to analyze tweets we are going to look at the time series analysis so see you in the next video bye